Hello, I'm John Hedinger, and my collaborator is Kevin Frankie here at Brigham Young University. We're working with graduate students Abe Martin, Derek Wolf, and Samantha Ruggles, with undergraduate students Spencer Christiansen and Landon Blackburn. Today I'm going to talk a little bit about infrastructure monitoring and th some of the things that you can do with photogrammetric methods to monitor infrastructure on a large scale or small scale as well. Be able to detect changes, uh, be able to detect uh, movement, um, so in addition to 3D point cloud models, we're also developing four-dimensional uh, point cloud models or 3D plus time. So this is one example. This is a geologic outcrop. You can see the trees in the background there just for a scale of reference. A very large structure. This is actually a computer-generated model from just taking individual photographs and then stitching those together to develop Three, a three-dimensional object, a point cloud that we can move around in a CAD environment. Um, this is particularly important for geologists to be able to see the different layers, be able to see how um, this reservoir developed over time. Book cliffs is one of the most highly studied areas for geologic outcrops. It's where many geologists go to get trained on reservoir analogs. So you see a slice of the uh, the, the cliff, basically a cutaway of the reservoir, and then you can infer things uh, on what's happening inside the reservoir. Um, so in, combined with core samples and uh, computer modeling, they're able to uh, be able to tell what's happening in that reservoir. Okay, so we wanted to develop, in that case, a, a detailed model so that geologists wouldn't necessarily have to go to the site, but from a visualization cave or from their offices, they could zoom in and look at different features of the geologic outcrop. So here are a couple other places we've been. Uh, Rock Canyon Park in Provo, that's obviously close to the university, so we use that as a test site for many of our algorithms. Uh, we also had North Salt Lake. Uh, recently there was a landslide where there was slope failure that damaged a house and a building. Um, also, Dinosaur National Park in Vernal, outside of that, in Vernal, Utah. Um, also, Steinecker Dam. Uh, there's some, uh, I'll, I'll talk about this a little bit later, but there's some slope failure right here um, that they wanted to uh, be able to monitor. Uh, Book Cliffs, as I mentioned before, um, and then US 89 near Page, Arizona. So, there was a slope failure that damaged the highway. Um, also, Chile had a devastating earthquake with liquefaction, and so we were called down there to uh, fly and monitor some of the, the, uh, the displacement that happened with the uh, liquefaction. Okay, and then also Joe's Valley and Huntington Reservoirs. Um, so in the case of Steinecker Dam, um, what we wanted to do with infrastructure monitoring or these structure from motion, taking pictures and be able to develop 3D models, uh, was to first of all measure and detect uh, slope failure. So um, be able to go back and um, you know, measure any changes. In this case, we went up in a helicopter and, and uh, flew and took pictures of this and then developed this uh, three-dimensional model before the dam was um, impounded. It was uh, loaded up with the, um, the reservoir. Okay, also uh, Chile um, measuring crack displacements. Okay, so how taking detailed measurements of these um, of these cracks uh, by developing these 3D models and then be able to in a CAD environment be able to take very precise measurements. Okay, um, now that was after this liquefaction and the um, the earthquake there, North Salt Lake's landslide. Okay, you can see here. Um, this is a, a, a 3D, uh, mod basically two models, and we're looking for changes. Okay, and so uh, high areas of change, like the red, you can see the house there that was once there, and then they removed it. So obviously that was a lot of change that happened there. But you can also see, you know, in this color graph, uh, right um, in this region, uh, there's still some erosion taking place and uh, possibly some movement happening happening at the toe of the landslide. Okay, so it allows us to, with these uh, multiple 3D models, we can uh, put those together and do change detection. Um, at the dinosaur, um, let's see, let's go to book cliffs. Uh, we wanted these geologic uh, outcrop models, and they're all over the world, uh, and help geologists understand uh, these uh, 
these geologic formations. Also, Dinosaur National Monument Orient model uh, to see horizontal bedding planes. Okay, so they wanted to be able to see uh, those. And then uh, in US 89, we did a detailed study of the accuracy of photogrammetric methods versus terrestrial laser scanning um, LIDAR. Okay, and you can see um, here are some boxes that we put in the road, and you can see um, the shape of those. This is just a cross section. So the accuracy of the photogrammetric methods is um, is approaching what uh, the highest accuracy terrestrial laser scanners can provide. Okay, so this is some of the um, the, the pro this is some of the progress that we've made uh, between. Uh, September 2013 and August 2015, the GND used 19 centimeters, and uh, now it's uh, 0.5 centimeters. Okay, uh, resolution uh, has improved uh, dramatically to almost 40,000 points per meter squared, and the accuracy has improved from 41 centimeters to now three centimeters. Okay, that's a, a Gauss mean um, average uh, for the accuracy. Okay, and you can also see just uh, in, by inspection, you can see some of the close-up detail there at the bottom uh, where we can look at individual rocks, whereas before it was more of just a general uh, kind of fuzzy point cloud. Okay, uh, what we've learned, some of the significant things about uh, improving the, the model quality, um, onboard GPS and telemetry data improves the model quality. Um, also camera selection as well. Um, we want a global shutter versus a uh, CMOS or uh, rolling shutter. Um, also the processing software. We've uh, partnered with 2D3 Sensing and um, are using Agisoft PhotoScan. Uh, ground control points um, help to georeference the uh, models and scale them accurately. I can also avoid curvature over long distances. Uh, platform selection is also critical as well. There are a number of things that we've learned about uh, how to take the kinds of pictures we need to develop high quality models. Then another thing that I'm going to be talking about in a little bit is flight plan optimization um, or flight path optimization. So how do we uh, plan how to take the pictures and from what angles in order to be able to achieve uh, the best quality. So here's another um, example of a, a point cloud model. Um, this is, uh, in this case, this is the North Salt Lake landslide um, where there was slope failure and uh, we went up there to uh, develop multiple models and do change detection, be able to look for further slope movement um, in this area. It's also been very useful for those studying uh, the abatement, other uh, methods, strategies to uh, arrest the, um, the movement of this landslide. Okay, so uh, one of the things that um, we're in the process of doing right now is we want to be able to see um, with different elements, be able to quantify exactly how much improvement in accuracy each of those give us. So for a particular job, we may have a requirement for five centimeter accuracy. Um, what combination of tools, platforms, camera will be able to give us um, this accuracy? Another way to put it is uh, how much do we need to invest in order to be able to achieve the right level of accuracy for solving the engineering problem. And so we're doing this study matrix with uh, GPS, no GPS, ground control points, no ground control points, and, uh, and then also the quality of the images in terms of total time to develop some of these models. So if, for example, on the left plot, you can see a quarter resolution. The processing time was 11.4 hours, whereas when we used half resolution, um, the processing time went up to, um, you know, about two days or 40, uh, about 45 hours. So um, each of those uh, steps, okay, so for case one, case two, case three, and case four, you can see that you get uh, possibly better quality models out of, you know, with more time that you've invested, but you know, what is the trade-off? Maybe for the engineering case, you only need um, the accuracy that's provided by case two, for example. Uh, so we wanna study, uh, and we're in the process of, of uh, writing the papers on this, 
uh, but what are the uh, trade-offs and uh, how do we get the kind of accuracy that we need. So now we're going to move on to view planning and optimization and uh, in particular we want to be able to maybe specify an accuracy that we need and with any platform be able to fly that in a way and capture uh, images in a way to meet that accuracy requirement. Okay, so the simulation process, this is the typical practice that we do on uh, any new site. We first of all load uh, USGS elevation data or other sources of elevation data. Um, we then perform a view plan optimization. So we use uh, optimization techniques to tell us where to fly and how to take the pictures. And then we load that into a simulated autopilot with a terrain simulation. Now this is um, you know, software that Hollywood uses to generate uh, artificial terrain. We, we simulate that, okay, and simulate the flights, develop the models with 3D reconstruction, and then do the point cloud analysis and see if we got the accuracy that we needed. And then we often go and fly the site as well to verify that we got the accuracy. So we're going to do two um, tests here. Test one is going to be the spillway in, in Provo. And then test two is a, Stein, is a, a reservoir, uh, the Steinecker Dam. Um, this one's about 50 meters, and this one's about 500 meters in uh, critical dimensions there. Okay, so this is the first one. This is the spillway. In this case, we said, let's have a constant number of images and then just compare the accuracy. So we did the grid survey model. Uh, now this is the standard approach when you're developing photogrammetric um, models from many consumer vendor platforms that you just fly this lawnmower type you know, with sufficient overlap uh, to be able to cover um, the whole area. Now this might work well for flat areas, but for anything with uh, three-dimensional aspects to it, um, we often want to uh, take pictures from the sides now there's so the, the uh, grid pattern doesn't work too well. And so we see, uh, in this case, only 71% coverage and 10% accuracy. And that's a mean Gauss error on accuracy. Um, okay, and then when you optimize the path, uh, you can see you're taking pictures. You know, each of these are uh, individual photograph. This is, again, 30 images. But you're taking it from different angles and different locations and then that leads to a 97% coverage and a 3.8 centimeter um, accuracy. So improvement by 62% and coverage improvement by 26%. Now let's look at this um, 500 meter uh, reservoir um, dam and, and when, now in this case this is a little bit different. Instead of uh, just holding the number of photos constant, we're allowing the optimizer to um, reduce the number of photos as long as it re achieves the required accuracy. In this case, um, the required accuracy uh, for the top one with the grid survey is, is 7.8 uh, centimeters, so we wanted to try to replicate that. Okay, so let's get about eight centimeters, uh, seven to eight centimeters of accuracy. And so what the optimizer did said, uh, you need to take far fewer images. So instead of 937, it only needed to take 579, leading to a reduction in flight time from 35 minutes to 17 minutes, or a 51% improvement in flight time. Um, so um, let's go on. So proposed um, next activities, we're going to be focusing on long linear features, optimization, and then also multi-sensor uh, combining uh, the photogrammetric methods with LiDAR. Okay, so long linear features, um, they're, you know, for infrastructure, they're pipelines, canals, roads, levees, and utility corridors. Um, we want to optimize the battery life, and uh, some of our preliminary results suggest a 10% energy savings on this approach. Um, we also want to do onboard processing, so instead of the pre-processing, fly post-processing, um, be able to generate these 3D point cloud models and look for anomalies and change detection in real time. So we're working on that um, and then also combining that with um, these LiDAR pucks uh, to be able to leverage the accuracy of the LiDAR with the resolution of the structure from motion. Okay, so I'd be glad to take 
any questions.